Good evening, everybody. My name is Dolores O'Riordan. I'm the director of UCD's Institute of Food and Health, and I'm delighted that you can join us this evening for the Institute's public lecture series that tonight will be on food safety. The concept of the Institute of Food and Health running this lecture series is to provide you, the public, with the best scientific evidence in areas that are of public interest. So I'm delighted tonight that we are joined by Professor Pat Wall. Pat is both a medical doctor and a veterinarian. He was head of the Foodborne Disease Surveillance Division in the UK CDC. He was the first CEO of the Food Safety Authority of Ireland and a chairperson of the European Food Safety Authority. He was a member of the Oversight Food Committee for the Beijing Olympic Games and is a member of the International Scientific Advisory Committee for the Chinese National Center for Food Safety and Saudi Arabia Food and Drug Authority. At UCD, he teaches veterinary students, medical students and students studying food safety. Pat's research is in the area of food safety. So tonight he's going to share with us his expertise. We will be delighted to field your questions. My colleague, Professor Lorraine Brennan, will moderate a question and answer session towards the end. So feel free to put your questions in the Q&A tab uh, on your screen and Lorraine will field those questions when Pat has finished his talk. Uh, people are often interested in the slides that are presented, so the talk will be available, available to you through the UCD's Institute of Food and Health uh, YouTube channel. So I'll pass to you now, Pat, if you can like to commence. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, thanks very much, Dolores, and uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I know I'm lucky that I don't have to com compete with Garth Brooks tonight, so on a wet evening, you can actually listen to stories about food safety. Uh, what I propose to do is give you a kind of an overview of uh, food safety. In UCD, we run a master's in food safety, so it takes a, a full uh, uh, year to cover it, all the subjects. So I'm just giving you a, a flavor of some of, the, of some of the issues, and you'll just see some of them you'll be interested in, some not. Anyway, as Dolor Dolores said, I actually uh, uh, was the, uh, or I am a professor in UCD in the School of Public Health, and I'm very fortunate with all the good colleagues I have here, we are doing some groundbreaking research. Uh, I was the CEO, the first CEO of the Food Safety Authority of Ireland that was set up in response to the BSE, the mad cow crisis. And uh, I was I made the transition from clinical medicine from being a doctor to uh, foodborne disease when I was the director of the UK CDC Foodborne Diseases Division. And uh, I spent a couple of great years in uh, Parma in Italy as the chairperson of the European Food Safety Authority, which oversees food safety for the European community. And uh, my best gig was uh, looking after food safety for the Olympic Games in Beijing in 2008. There'd been so many food scares in China that the International Olympic Committee insisted that there was an oversight committee for food safety for the Games. Now, so we looked after food safety for the, for not for China or not for Beijing, just for the Olympic Village and the 32 venues. but. We managed to uh, ensure that nobody got food poisoning, but it was state of the art. The Chinese government uh, spared no money to make sure that the food was safe. Anyway, if I asked you a question, what is your most valuable asset? What would your answer be? You know, uh, some people think it's their house, their cars, their stocks, their shares or whatever, but your health is your most uh, valuable asset and uh, food, good food and safe food is fundamental to good health. So, you know, during the COVID crisis, we heard a lot about the frontline workers being the health professionals, the doctors and the nurses. But the doctors and nurses, they're not the health professionals. In fact, they're the sickness professionals. They're focused on ill people. So people that are involved in uh, the food business, nutrition and, and food safety, they're actually health professionals, as are people who are involved in exercise and, and, and mindfulness and looking after the healthy. So that's the... Uh, the argument I use when I'm talking to everybody along the food chain uh, to make them pay a good close attention to food safety is that like they're health professionals. If they make a mistake, people can get sick. So uh, access to safe, nutritious, affordable food is essential to good health. So when you look at the food chain, it starts on the farms with crops and uh, animal feed, production, storage, processing, transport, distribution, wholesale, 
retail packaging catering all the way to your kitchens. So like everybody at every stage has a responsibility for food safety. And if a mistake happens early in the food, food chain, it has repercussions for the entire food chain. Uh, the food chain, we, we talk about it as a food chain and we've naively convinced the public that it's a straight line from farm to fork, but uh, it's far from a straight line. So, you know, the food chain is, if you think of just at the, at the farm side, and uh, you, this is when people, you often hear people saying, I, I just shop in my local markets, you know, I just want to buy local food. But on a farm, all the agrochemicals, the fertilizers, the sprays, the pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, they're all imported from, from abroad. The pharmaceuticals, these are the, the antibiotics and drugs that worm doses that are given to the animals, all come ab from abroad. They might be sourced locally from the local vet, but they come from abroad. And would you believe all the minerals and vitamins that we currently use in the European Union in animal feed are imported from China? And animal feed, we don't grow any soya bean in Ireland, for example. A lot of the animal feed is imported from, uh, from abroad. So, you know, when people say we only shop local, you know, if you go to your local market, you ask people, where do they get the fertilizers? Where do they get the medication for the animals? Where do they get the animal feed? In the middle of the food chain, much of the food we buy has multiple ingredients in it and there's additives and flavorings and we don't grow spices and herbs in Ireland. So everything is globally sourced. And then finally, different countries have different standards of food safety. In the European Union, we have one food law uh, and it's a single market. So the standards should be the same throughout the European Union. But the official control, this is the inspectorate that they have for inspecting the food chain in each country, is very much dependent on the economy of the country. And if countries are uh, in a crisis, or if there's turbulence or political instability or conflict, uh, you know, the food safety controls go by the wayside. Traceability, can you have traceability in this, in this maze? You can, but uh, you can't have precise traceability. And global threats, all you have to do is to stand the next time you're down in the supermarket stand in front of the vegetable stall and start reading the labels where the the fruit and vegetable has come from you know we have fruit and vegetables in season the whole year round in ireland but you might be getting mash toots from kenya you might be getting blueberries from peru you might be getting uh, gala apples from new zealand and so people are, stuff is coming in from all over the world so global threats something could be happening in another country get to ireland very quickly we don't grow bananas in ireland for example so that was the point I wanted to make to you there, that we actually, believe it or not, even if you try to buy Irish the whole time, you were actually eating off a, a global plate from a global marketplace. Just to give you an example of it, this man delivers a food product with 35 ingredients from 60 countries and five continents. What's he delivering in one box? A pizza. So every time you're having a pizza, you know, it might be made in Ireland, and this is actually an Irish pizza, but... Uh, Basically, the ingredients come from all over the place, you know. Uh, so farmers are getting a bit of a whacking at the moment. Uh, they're actually, uh, people think the farmers are producing too much greenhouse gases, whatever. But like whether we're wanting a plant-based diet or we want to eat meat and dairy, uh, we need farmers. And so if there's no farmers, there's no food, there's no future. A little girl's a friend of mine's daughter. She's actually advertising the job. In just one pizza, this is back to the pizza, just to show you. This pizza made in Ireland, the dough comes from France, UK, Poland, or the USA. The yeast comes from the UK, Ireland, or Germany. Salt could be from the UK, France, or China. Sugar, Brazil, Indonesia, Jamaica, UK. The tomato paste, Italy, Spain, Greece, France. These are all the proved suppliers of this company. Herbs from Greece, Italy, Spain, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and Morocco. And then the toppings. So you can see the cheese country from Switzerland, Ireland, France, Italy, Spain, ham from Ireland, Netherlands, UK, chili, chicken from Thailand, Brazil, or Ireland, chili peppers, we don't grow them in Ireland, anchovies from Peru, pepperoni from Poland, Italy, UK, Denmark, vegetables, garlic, mushrooms, sweet peppers, onions, Mediterranean countries, olive oil, we don't grow any olives in Ireland, Italy. So you can, the point I was making is like, you know, you might think you're eating something that says made in Ireland. Country of origin is Ireland. It's an Irish pizza, but the ingredients are from all over the world. Here's this one. This is in, in 2008. We had a, a crisis uh, associated with contaminated pig feed, and we had to do a recall of all Irish pork and bacon. And uh, I was in a, a factory in the UK, 
and they had uh it was just before Christmas so in the UK they have turkey and ham like we have here and there was all these honey glazed hams hanging up and a lovely smell of them and uh there was 10 farms implicated in Ireland you know but we had to do a global recall because we couldn't identify the produce from the contaminated farms so I said to to the owner this were any of those hams from the from Ireland or were they from the backsides of any Irish pigs and he said you tell me he says because we buy them as three separate mussels and put them together in a mold so there you are you think you're having a big piece of ham in fact it's actually three mussels put together in a mold in a net only glazed and a bone stuck in the middle of it so it's just a, this is just to show you how complex the food chain is so the global food chain as I say it's difficult so how can we police it the answer is not too easy not too easy we have a standard set for the European Union so the we have regulations that the food producers have to comply with and we have standards uh, set by the WTO which is the World Trade Organization for countries outside the EU so the countries all have we have they have to meet these standards if they're to trade with us uh, Frontline inspectorate, like the, the food chain is, is, is inspected and we have in Ireland uh, inspectors that inspect different segments of the food chain. So, for example, the Department of Agriculture looks after farms, uh, customs and excise looks after imports, the local authorities look after small businesses and uh, small abattoirs, the Department of Marine looks after fisheries, the Department of Health and the HSE, they have environmental health officers that do all the hotels and restaurants and small shops. Enterprise and trade look after bigger businesses and the Department of the Environment look after the water supply, which is crucial. So the, the way we coordinate all of these uh, inspectors in Ireland to try and develop a seamless inspector is we have the Food Safety Authority. So Food Safety Authority of Ireland is like the conductor of the orchestra. And each of the, um, uh, the Food Safety Authority has a service level agreement with each of these agencies to deliver a certain level of inspections and a, to a certain standard, which they inspect. So this is how we get a kind of harmonious uh, inspectorate from farm to the consumer. So uh, the Irish Food Safety Agency was, because we're a small country, it was easy for us to develop it. So we were the first of these in the European Union and many of the other European member states have, have copied Ireland, you know. And uh, But that's how, that's how we get the inspectorate. So all the different government agencies they look after little bits of the food chain and it's coordinated by the conductor of the orchestra, which is the Food Safety Authority. The Food Safety Authority has about 250 core staff and there's about 2,500 people working in all the different agencies looking after food safety in Ireland. But primary responsibility for producing safe food rests with the companies. The, uh, the inspector just verifies that the law has been complied with. Then you see they have on the in the European Union we have the European Centre for Disease Control in Stockholm, which monitors uh, outbreaks of disease. And uh, the Infosan is the WHO uh, section that looks after outbreaks of disease and the national agencies, and they all feed in together. And the uh, European Food Safety Authority and the CDC, which is the Centre for Disease Control in America. And basically, any because we live in a global village and there's food distributed all over the place. Some of the food could cause poisoning in a country who, which has good surveillance systems and good laboratory systems, and they could pick it up. And if they do, they then have this food alert system that they share with all the other countries. So often a problem is identified in one country, picked up in another, because often the health of a country's citizens very much depends on the standards in another country where the food is manufactured. So there's many issues under the food safety umbrella so this evening, I just thought I'd just touch on a few, and that's all I'm going to do is touch on them. If you need to know a lot about these, you'll have to enroll for a master's in UCD. Uh, one, climate change and food security. Two, foreign bodies, chemical contamination, microbial contamination, allergens and food fraud. And these are six uh, chapters in the food safety book, should I say. So with climate change, uh, and as the climate rises, you get droughts, which is, uh, affects uh, crop production, uh, but it also... Uh, the, the raised temperature we, has resulted in new plant diseases because insects that heretofore weren't in one country can now survive in a, in a country where, which had been too cold heretofore and new animal diseases. So basically the bugs are, are, are moving around and so uh, often you get diseases in animals that actually these animals died from a disease called rinderpest. This doesn't affect humans but basically it causes human disease because 
causes hunger for a start, but people are inclined to eat animals that shouldn't be eaten that have gone off, you know. Scarcity of water is a huge issue globally. Now, that's a good thing to say in Ireland because it rains twice a week, once for three days and the next time for four. But there is a scarcity of water in the, in the world. And as I said, we buy a lot of fruit and vegetables from all over the world. And in countries where they have a lovely climate for growing fruit and veg, water is scarce. So they irrigate the water, like irrigate the plants like this. And sometimes they don't use potable water. Drinking water is precious. So they might use contaminated water. It could be contaminated with uh, animal manure or even human manure. And actually uh, they use it to water the plants. And so we've, we've, we're getting outbreaks associated with fruit and veg now. And people say, well, you know, the animals harbor a lot of bugs. I'm going to be a vegetarian, but we still get uh, outbreaks of diseases that originated in animal manure in people that are vegetarians. One big challenge for us is that uh, we source animal feed globally. So like soya bean is grown in the prairies of Canada and in Brazil and Argentina, it's brought in big ships. And so these ships arrive in say Dublin port, 50,000 tons of the ship. The ships are, uh, they do a thing called just in time delivery. They just deliver it and then they want to go immediately to to collect their next load somewhere else. So the stuff is offloaded and uh, brought to the mills and it's incorporated into animal feed very quickly. And it's very hard to, it takes a while to take samples and actually get the samples analyzed. But how many samples do you take from a 50,000 ton ship to be sure that it's uh, that it's actually uh, isn't contaminated? And basically this is why you need global controls and you need controls on the farms. To make sure that the, the crops are produced without too many chemicals and the chemical withdrawal times are adhered to. Safe animal feed is essential for safe human food. So this is when I say to the farmers, you're in the food business, because if the cows eat food that's contaminated, they, you end up with contaminated milk and you can end up with contaminated meat. And so uh, that's an issue for us. Marine pollution is a huge issue, huge issue for us now. And uh, the seas are full of plastics and uh, broken down plastics and, and, and nanoplastics, which come from textiles. Fast fashion has contributed to a lot of uh, microplastic fibers in the sea, which end up in, in fish. Uh, this is just a, a whale that was washed up off the coast of Italy and he had 22 grams of plastic in his stomach. And, uh, you know, the sustainable development goals are goals that are set by the, the World Health Organization, which is an offshoot of the United Nations. But number 12 is responsible consumption and production. This means that we have to produce stuff in a way that isn't damaging the environment. And uh, number 14 is life below water. This is actually making sure that we're not polluting the seas. Food security and food waste is a huge issue. And would you believe there's enough food wasted in the, uh, in the UK that would feed a country in Africa? And we waste a lot of food here in Ireland too. And like there's an awful lot of food is destroyed because uh, it's the wrong shape or whatever for the supermarkets or it's just surplus to requirement. And so there's a big risk that if food is dumped, that it starts to be reused as animal feed or worse again, human food. And so if you're going to use, reuse the food, you have to keep it inside in a controlled environment. You can't dump it and have it as waste and then bring it back into the food chain. Now, I was saying about a couple of hazards that you get in food and one of them is foreign bodies. And so foreign bodies appear in, in, in food and uh, this is a piece of tissue. Uh, not very pleasant if you're eating a sandwich and you find that. Uh, this is a little cable tie that we found in a, in a, in a sliced pan. This would be more serious now. This is a little shard of metal that came off in a processing factory. And basically, this is something that could choke a child or choke an adult. It's dangerous. We often find insects. So sometimes insects lay eggs in fruit. And as I said, fruit comes from everywhere. But by the time it arrives in Ireland, they've hatched. And so um, when you're having a meal and you open up the tin and you find this, it's not too pleasant, you know, not good. And, and the insects can spread disease. This is just to show you another example. Do you remember I said that when water is scarce, rather than spray the whole field with water, they run the pipes through the field and they have a little chute for spraying the water. Just, they just use much less water because they just spray it right onto the plants. But because they do that, the only place in the field that's moist is the, um, are the, are the lettuce, for example, in this case. And sometimes the uh, amphibians hide in there. And so you end up, this is a little lad that made his way into a pack of lettuce. So if you or, or, or greens. And so when you open your greens and you find a frog in there, well, that's where he came from. 
chemicals in the food chain are important as well, you know. And so environmental contamination is one source of chemicals. Residues from production processes along the food chain. And this could be residues of disinfectants, residues of agrochemicals, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, antibiotic residues if they were used in the animals. Uh, food production. This is actually sometimes during processing, you get chemicals uh, generated by reactions between food when food is cooked. Like there's a cancer producing chemical called acrylamide that is produced when starch is heated to high temperature. So that's found in chips. Natural toxins are uh, fungi produce toxins. They're called mycotoxins. So if you see mold grown on bread, that produces a toxin uh, and you get uh, shellfish. If the water they're growing in is contaminated, you can get biotoxins and this makes people sick. Then you get accidental contamination. Occasionally, you know, uh, engineers in a food processing factory might spill diesel or petrol or oil or some cleaning chemical into the food. And finally, sometimes you get deliberate contamination. Deliberate contamination can be uh, a disgruntled worker who's sacked before he leaves. He says, I'll get my own back on the bus and dump something into the food. Or you get criminals who contaminate food and then actually try and blackmail the company. So what I mean by environmental contamination is if, if you grow crops in the vicinity where there's pollutants in the air and the water, it's taken up in the soil from the soil, you know, and so therefore, if you eat these crops, they can have chemicals, heavy metals or worse. Uh, so it's a huge issue. In um, China, we had a project where we were using uh, bees as sentinels of environmental hazards. Uh, sentinel is a, an animal that you use for monitoring the environment. The original sentinel was the canary down the mine. So the, this is before they had oxygen monitors. Canaries are, are all birds have, haven't got lungs, they've got air saccules and they're much more sensitive to oxygen depletion. So the, the miners would have their canary with them and when the canary stopped singing, it was a sign that there was um, uh, oxygen levels were low and the oxygen could fall off. If the canary fell off his perch, well, that meant you get out quick. But basically we were able to monitor uh, honey so if the bee, whatever area is going to, if the, if the area that the bees is contaminated with is, uh, is contaminated with heavy metals or, or organophosphates, the bees pick it up and it, they bring it back and we find it in the honey. And so there was a while there, uh, we were finding honey imported from China into the European Union con contaminated with cadmium. And we were wondering, how did the cadmium get into the honey? And basically it was that the environment where the bees were foraging was contaminated with uh, cadmium and the bees were picking it up. And so this little bee here, believe it or not, is a, it has little radio frequency identifiers on them and we could track how far the bee would go. So it's amazing, a bee can fly up to five kilometers uh, from the hive. So these bees weren't actually honeybees. These were actually being used as environmental monitors because we were putting the hive in the center of an area and then that was analyzing the honey and it told us what chemicals were in the five kilometer environment. Uh, you know, if we're actually, when we grow plants, uh, we actually have to, believe it or not, use a lot of sprays if you're not organic. And so sprays are used to kill insects, to kill fungi and to kill weeds. And so uh, we need safe plant protection products. And so uh, if, if we actually are to go move from a, an animal-based diet to a plant-based diet, we'll have to grow a lot more fruit and veg. And, we'll have to use a lot more uh, chemicals. So uh, it wouldn't be possible to feed the world organically. So there's a huge job of work to do. These chemicals, they're sprayed. And uh, when they're sprayed, they're, the farmers have to leave time for the chemical to be absorbed and, and, and uh, gone from the plant before they're harvested. But often uh, in, in Ireland, every farmer who uses these sprays has to complete a course with Chagas to be trained in the use of sprays so they use the right concentration at the right time. But in some of the developing countries, some of the workers on the farms are, are, aren't that well educated. And so it's a huge job of work to watch this space. And this is actually in a greenhouse spraying, you know, and like, you know, every one of us has uh, some friend or other who had cancer and like people who get cancer, it's not an accident. They've been exposed to some sort of a toxin, either a toxin in the air, a toxin in the water, a toxin in the food, something that has triggered the cancer gene. So this is a big issue for us and it takes a lot of monitoring to make sure. There's a big concern globally that the bee population is being uh, depleted by all the chemicals we're using. So 75% of crops eaten by humans are pollinated by bees. 
So if we actually kill a lot of bees, because some of these insecticides, they're actually, they kill all insects, the good ones as well as the bad ones. Microbial contamination. This is something that when people think about food poisoning, they usually think of being poisoned by bugs like different species of Salmonella, Campylobacter, E. coli. And so there's a whole lot of uh, bugs that can be in your food. Food isn't sterile. And uh, basically these are the sort of uh, guidelines. You know, you have to keep your kitchen clean. You have to separate raw food from uh, cooked food or food that isn't going to be heat treated. So meat isn't sterile. Like abattoirs are not operating theaters. So you have to assume that meat has germs in it. And therefore you don't want to chop your meat and then chop your vegetables with the same knife on the same block because you could be bringing some nasties across. Oh, most of these nasties are killed by cooking, but you have to cook to 70 degrees. And so this is a thermometer, someone sticking in their chicken fillets to make sure they're cooked well. And then um, the bugs, most of the bugs don't grow in the fridge. And so you, if you freeze your food or chill it to below four degrees. So some people have a fridge, but they're all the time opening it and closing it, never gets below four degrees. Or they pack the fridge so, so tight that the temperature can't get down to four degrees. So uh, they're just simple things that you can do yourself. So that's just a chopping block to keep them separate. This is just to give you an example of a lot of breaded products. They're just flash fried in processing to stick the, uh, the crust of, of, of bread coatings on, but they're not cooked. So some people think that they're cooked, but you have to read the label closely to make sure that, uh, and most of them have to be cooked. So if you just heat up some of these breaded products, you end up with bread, raw meat in the middle. This is raw, this is a raw chicken. And so they could harbor bugs that can make your family sick. You often hear safe food, uh, and the Food Safety Authority giving advice to uh, not to wash your chickens because chickens can have germs on them. And this is just an example of uh, this, this chicken, we painted it with a harmless bug that was fluorescent. So when the chicken was washed, you can see the harmless bug went everywhere. Now, if that was a nasty, you have contaminated your whole kitchen. So one good thing about COVID uh, was that we got uh, enhanced laboratory capabilities because we developed all these PCR laboratories throughout Ireland for rapid diagnostics and whole genome sequencing. This is sequencing the bugs like fingerprinting. When they talk about different variants of the virus, uh, like the, the, the Delta and the Omicron and the Wuhan strain, uh, this uh, whole genome sequencing, we specialized in teaching that here in UCD. We thought that we were special, but now everyone's talking about variants of, of COVID. What variant did you have? So it's not so special anymore, but we have all these uh, laboratories in that uh, throughout the globe now who have uh, this capability. So we'll be turning more and more on food safety and bioinformatics is how you analyze the variants. Rapid antigen tests are now mass produced and rapid antigen tests weren't designed for COVID. You can use rapid antigen tests for any disease. So they'll be used much more now because the mass production has made them very cheap. We've learned how to share surveillance data much more, much quicker. If you remember the South African strain was identified uh, on a Wednesday and the sequence was shared in the EU and we had it up in the EU on, on the Friday. So also we've made a quantum leap from uh, in science communication and the public are, are much more aware of issues now and like Luke O'Neill is a film star now uh, for you know telling everyone about complex things and lay aside and make them easy so people understand about sequencing and and variants and sure everybody's a microbiologist after COVID. Uh, so this is the thing you need to know your enemy and uh, so now we're able to identify the bugs in much more detail than ever before. Uh, what's a zoonosis? This is just going to say a few words about these. Zoonosis are diseases that are spread from animals to people. So basically, if an animal has a disease, when that animal is slaughtered, it can go with the meat into the food chain or it can go with the milk into the food chain if, if it's coming through the milk. It can be chickens, can be pigs, can be fish. They're all zoonosis. So now, now with the... Um, the, the sequencing that we're able to do, we can kind of barcode the bug coming out of the sick patients, right? Or in the sick patient, right? And uh, then we can track it back and we find the same bug in the food. Then we can find it in the restaurant. Then we can find it in a processor. Then we can actually, well, I go back. We can go back to the farmers or the feed mill. So we're able to track back to find out where the problem was and where the source came from and, and where we need to uh, fix the problem so that more people don't fall ill. Now, you've heard a lot about... Uh, you know, the way viruses spread in congregated settings. And so we couldn't congregate during COVID. But when we're mass producing food, we've actually, we've
we do a thing called high stocking rates. So if you actually, 60% of the fish weed is farmed. So this is a salmon uh, cage here, and you can see the number of fishes in there. So high stocking rates facilitate the disease transmission. The same with chickens. These are chickens all together now. These are pigs. So like you can imagine if a germ gets in here, how quickly it can go. Now, mass producing food like this makes it cheap. Uh, you can control the air, the water, the feed, but if something goes wrong, you can get a massive spread of disease. This is the same as beef animals, right? So uh, foodborne zoonosis control, you know, if we had talk about salmonella, campylobacter, virocytotoxin producing E. coli, some of the nasty bugs that can affect humans, the way to control these is to control them uh, on the farms, not in your kitchen. And so like, it's like uh, your kitchen is flooding because someone left the taps on in the bathroom. There's no point being down in the kitchen with a bucket trying to keep bailing out. You need to go up and turn the taps off in the bathroom. So we need to control the diseases in the animals to make sure that they're not introducing the bugs into the food chain. Animal welfare is a huge issue. One, none of us want animals to be stressed, but when animals are stressed is another issue. Stressed animals are more susceptible to disease. When animals get disease, they, they require antibiotics to treat them. We can't neglect them. So if you use antibiotics in a, a hospital or on a farm, you kill all the sensitive bugs and you kill all the sensitive bugs and, and certain bugs then who are resistant to antibiotics survive. These are super bugs. So that they actually multiply up and then you have to go with a more powerful antibiotic and then you kill all those bugs and then be another one that's resistant to two antibiotics and this goes on and eventually you have bugs that are, we've no antibiotics to treat. And this is a huge concern. So with uh, this next generation sequencing, it's uh, this whole genome sequencing that I described, where we, we can measure all the genes and the bugs. We're able to, there's been a revolution in, 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 in the study of the bugs, and we can identify gene sequences that contribute to uh, antibiotic resistance. And we can link cases, we can sequence bugs and animals, we can sync up bugs and food, we can, we can sequence bugs in the environment and bugs of people and we can find out where people are getting infected or if there was an outbreak in one restaurant and an outbreak in another uh, are they linked or if you have say 10 people were at Garth Brooks concert and they all ate a burger from a burger van outside Crow Park and they just they disseminated to 10 different counties in Ireland we could sequence the bug and we find all, all these people have the same bug then we interviewed them asked them what did you eat before you will we could link them all together you find out they all ate out of one burger van um, antimicrobial resistance is a big issue. We have to control the use of antibiotics. This isn't, isn't an animal issue. It's not a poultry issue. It's not a pig issue. It's not a bug issue. Uh, none of the animals are looking for drugs. It, it's a human issue. We actually treat, give the animals to the bugs. And so therefore, how are we going to use less antibiotics? And uh, this is a question I ask the farmers when I chat to them and the veterinarians. Uh, just have the answer is simple, have less disease. So we need to actually have... Uh, a whole range of things we can do, biosecurity on the farms, better genetics. We breed animals, particularly for food conversion efficiency, egg production, milk yield, or whatever. Now we need to breed animals that are for disease resistance, better nutrition of the animals, vaccinate the animals, treat them very early, and quarantine sick animals, and uh, eradicate disease. And we, we're doing that. You know? So there's a, bit, a lot of initiatives underway, and antibiotics are very controlled now. The, the vets have to give the animals, have to have prescriptions just like humans, you know? The other thing that comes under the food safety umbrella, which is a risk for you, is uh, allergens. If you're allergic, some people are allergic, then you, you could be allergic to milk and you might get a rash or shellfish, you could get a rash or whatever. But some people can get a thing called anaphylactic reaction where their uh, larynx swells up and they could choke because uh, they are they get oedema of their larynx and it's life-threatening. So therefore, it's people that are allergic need to look at the labels and see uh, what the allergens in the food and this is a big issue for companies that are manufacturing food that they have to segregate the production of foods cakes or confectionery or whatever it is with particular allergens from ones that are non non-allergen so they label something that doesn't have milk in it or doesn't have eggs in it they can't have carry over from a previous run so they either have a different factory or maybe on one particular day they 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 produce the products with the allergens in it and the other days they don't so that they can actually uh, prevent uh, people getting allergic reactions, which is, can be quite nasty for some people. Food fraud is a big issue, and uh, we have a, a big challenge with this. Like, this is actually minced meat. If I said to you, what animal does this mince come from? Would you be able to say by looking at it? What animal muscle is this? This is a kebab, you know? This was actually, uh, uh, they did an analysis of kebabs in the UK, and it was 
lamb kebabs. There was no lamb in them, you know. There were other things, you know. This is your chicken curry. Would you know if there was chicken? Sometimes there's so much curry in it. Could it be pigeon? Um, what we really need is um, something like the sniffer dogs in the airport to give us a quick result because we can analyze uh, food to find out what, uh, what exactly it is. But if we do that, it takes time. And uh, sometimes uh, there isn't that time. If the food is perishable, for example, the lab results for chemical analysis and can take uh, a week or two weeks and therefore the shelf life will be gone at that stage. So basically you want a dog that could sniff it. That'd be the ideal because we have to use laboratory tests and that takes time. And uh, most of the food safety tests that are done on the spot or the quick tests are, are done for microbes, not for constituents. So there has been, a, there is a whole lot of food fraud and most of it is economically motivated. So the greed, greed is a great motivator. This is one that uh, cheaper uh, wine, cheaper year is substitute for a more expensive one. And, you know, you, 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 you might be enjoying the 2013 wine, which is half the price of the 209 one. So you'd still be a nice wine, unless you were a French person or a connoisseur, you might know the difference. But if you're a crook and you just switch the labels, you can actually make money. Uh, olive oil, do you know, can you tell the difference between uh, extra virgin olive oil or uh, standard olive oil or, or pomace olive oil? Pomace olive oil is, is, is a cheap, 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 cheap olive oil, or even if they have a blended olive oil that they're using some other vegetable oils mixed with it. And so there's huge fraud through the EU on olive oil. Coffees, you know, like you might, you know, the difference between Colombian coffee or Tanzanian coffee or best Brazilian coffee or whatever, the deep roasted coffee, you know, there's a huge opportunity here. Co different coffees, different prices. But when you're getting your latte, can you really tell the difference? So therefore, much of the food fraud, it goes undetected because you think it was a lovely cup of coffee. Um, manuka honey. Manuka honey is a, a honey that is, you know, marketed with additional health properties, whether it does or it doesn't. That's another issue. But there's more manuka honey consumed in the UK than is produced in New Zealand because it's just easy to put the manuka label on any honey. So country of origin is a huge issue. So therefore, if this is standard honey, you actually... Uh, call it Manuka, you, you treble the price. And I, 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 I'd I, ask you to look at your next jar of honey that you buy and look at the small print. And it might have an Irish name. It could be Inish Free or it could be anything. I don't name any brands, but you look at the small print, tiny print, and you'll say, made from a blend of EU and non-EU honey. Made from a blend of EU and non-EU honey. Now, a blend is a great word because it could be 99% Chinese and 1% EU but it's still a blend. Country of origin, you know, organic honey. Can you tell the difference from organic honey and non-organic honey? Cod and chips. Uh, the uh, Food Safety Authority of Ireland did uh, actually uh, a survey of fish and chip shops in Dublin a few years ago, and uh, most of the cod wasn't cod at all. Now, they published it. Nobody got too upset about that. When the horse meat scandal was on and they discovered that the beef Burgers were horse meat. People got upset, but nobody got upset about the fish. But basically, fish of inferior quality is often substitute for higher value varieties. So this is just an example of the different fish that's, that uh, is actually involved in, in, in the scams. So basically, you can see they can fit, farm salmon to replace, you know. Crab meat, you know, you can buy crab meat. Would you know it was a crab? You'd want to be a connoisseur? Or is it made from comminuted fish? like fish fingers. Can you tell the difference in wild and farm salmon? Easy to differentiate in a lab, but not in a kitchen. And they, here's one of the inspectors like, you know, I think it's cod, but maybe it's Pollock. They, he, the inspectors do these visual inspections, but they can't tell the difference. You have to send the stuff to a lab. Uh, Parma ham, special hams, special price. If it's, some people call hams made somewhere else Parma ham, it'd be nice ham, but it's not Parma ham. Same with uh, Parmesan cheese. I, I, I'll give you these two examples because when I was in uh, in Italy, the European Food Safety Authority was located in Parma and the Parma people were very upset about these scams. Free range eggs, they're more expensive than, 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 than farm or uh, barn fed hens. Would you tell the difference? Could you tell the difference? It's very tempting for mislabeling. Organic food, can you tell the difference? You know, um, yeah, are these organic carrots or just deformed carrots? We have actually um, barcode technology now, which is trying to 
police the supply chain so that you can have a traceability the barcode can carry all kinds of information so you can actually a total food chain approach on produce which would be fruit and vegetables meat poultry and processed food but it's challenging and uh, remember the slides i showed you of the pizza but there's ingredients from all over the place in it you know so just to give you an idea that it's it's not simple and uh, this is the the last slide for you now just to show I, what i wanted to sh show you tonight was how complex food safety is so it's it's about protecting the public's health but it's also protecting consumer confidence so nobody wants to be ripped off if you're buying a particular product that's what it should be it shouldn't be something else or it should be it shouldn't have a substituted product if you're buying crab claws it should be crab claws or if you're buying uh wild salmon it should be wild salmon uh, the other one is science with science based there's a lot of science and we have food scientists and food safety scientists in ucd working on uh, the latest science to make to evaluate the safety of pesticides herbicides analyze the bugs analyze the chemicals regulations to inform the regulations we have to have science-based regulations and as i said we have european-wide regulations that are enforced in every country and any country importing into the eu has to uh, comply with the eu regulations and the eu have a team of auditors it's called uh, from their food and veterinary office and interestingly the food and veterinary office from the eu was decentralized from brussels when uh, uh to to ireland so we have the headquarters of that group and they go and visit all the third countries to check out that they are reaching the eu standards uh, there's a lot of politics in food safety because many countries think their food is safer than everybody else's and it's every time anyone gets sick and there's an outbreak people immediately say oh it's got to do with dodgy foreign imports which isn't the case and business food safety is a business uh we've increasingly uh have cheaper and cheaper food and uh when you get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper like it actually tempts people to take shortcuts and cut corners so uh given that food is we are what we eat and food is fundamental to good health uh you know are we paying enough for food the answer is we're probably not okay that's the end of the slide if you need any more you'll have to enroll for a degree in ucd and you'll be welcome thank you very much